I had read that Agatha Christie did not plot her mystery novels. And what she did, and I've heard several other mystery writers say that they do the same thing, is that they come up with a cast of characters, all of whom have motive and opportunity and who are interconnected. And, um, and then they just let things happen. And then, and then at the end, they decide which one of them actually did it. And that's when they reveal the final clue. All right, welcome everybody to another author chat here on SFF Addicts, and I have the absolute pleasure today of talking with Mary Robinette Koal. She's an award-winning author, podcaster, and puppeteer. Her written works include the Lady Astronaut series, The Glamorous Histories, and more, and her latest release is The Spare Man, which just hit stores on October 11th, and she's also a co-host on the podcast Writing Excuses with Brandon Sanderson, Dan Wells, and Howard Taylor. So welcome to the show, Mary Robinette. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you again. And before we get started, I just want to say congratulations on the release of your new book. How are you feeling? How's the release been going so far? I know you're on tour, so. Um, I'm doing, I'm, I'm feeling really well. It's uh, the. It's been fun to get out and uh, share it with people. Um, I've been really particularly enjoying um, watching my social media, which I have, I have never had so many people post pictures of cocktails and my book before. <laughs> <laughs> and it is delightful. <laughs> I mean, it's perfect. Every chapter starts with a cocktail. And uh -huh. we will get into that. We will get into yes, it. But yes. to kick things off, I want to know a bit more about you. You know, what was your relationship with SFF and reading and that kind of stuff growing up? Growing up, I, um, I read voraciously. Um, we listened to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on the radio as nice. family. Uh, I was a big fan of Doctor Who very early. Um, and, you know, I started reading science fiction and fantasy. The moment that I understood that it was a genre, that's the section of the, the store and the library that I always went to. And before that, I was just like, is there a spaceship on the cover? Is there a dragon? <laughs> So, um, so it's, it, it, it's just been a, a lifelong love for me. Yeah. And so when you're going to do bookstores and stuff like that, just checking out the covers is like, I know exactly where I'm headed. And did you, did you read anything outside of that? Cause you know, like mysteries and things like that. Yeah. When I'm not reading SF, I tend to go, um, I mean, or, or research books, uh, mystery and romance tend to be the two places that I'll land. Mm-hmm. And those did, those did appear in your glamorous histories and then mystery appears yeah. in, the, in the spare man. But a quick tangent before we get deeper into your writing, tell me more about puppeteering. Cause every time you brought that up on writing <laughs> excuses, I was like, oh, that's so freaking cool. You know, how did you get involved in that? And what appeals to you about puppetry? Um, so I was one of those kids who wanted to do everything. And, uh, when I was, Somewhere in high school, one of my friends went to a church that had a puppet troupe. And I'm like, really? And basically joined her church to be in the puppet troupe, which is either the best reason or really it's, you know, not the best. I don't know how you want to count that. But, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I did that through high school. I had no idea it was a career. And then when I was in college, we were doing Little Shop of Horrors and a professional puppeteer came to see the show. And I was like, wait a minute, people give you money to do this? And basically changed career choices on the spot. Uh, went off, did his internship at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, Georgia, started touring with a marionette production, and did that for about 20 years. Have Not the marionettes, back? but just touring, touring puppetry in general. Yeah. Have you gone back to it at any point? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, since the pandemic, I haven't, I don't think I've done anything for pay. Um, but the, the rest of it, it's just, you know, cause a lot of the places just, it's just hard. Um, but I still audition anytime a new show opportunity comes up. Um, I still use it in my teaching um, to demonstrate different aspects of character development for writers. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I, I will manipulate anything at the drop of a hat. Like 
I will manipulate the hat, like, you know. <laughs> In order to get back into puppetry. I love that. Yeah. And speaking of pivots, you were also an art director for SFF magazines. How did that help you in your journey towards publication, you know, and at the same time, what drew you to this world of, of writing? Well, I was an art major in college and um, it started with Shimmer Magazine, um, which uh, Beth Wudzinski um, and uh, several other people and I were working on. Beth continued doing that. And it was, you know, that thing where, where someone's like, hey, we should put on a show. And you're like, my uncle has a barn. Yeah. Um, it was like, <laughs> I'm an art major. I can do the art direction. The... So it it started as a way to um, to participate in that and to to help bring a magazine out that that opened up doors for for writers. Um, and then I was doing stuff with weird tales. Um, but generally speaking, it, it was um, while I enjoyed it, it was a distraction from the writing. Um, it used some of the same parts of my brain, but it was not, um, it was just, it was a different career track. So after, uh, after I did weird tales, I didn't pursue any other uh, art director, dark art direction gigs. I still love art, but it was, it was not where I wanted to be spending my energy. That's totally fair. And at the same time, you know, you realize that it it was taking away from from the writing aspect of it. But what kind of insights did you accrue while you were doing that that art direction stuff? Mostly how to talk to an art director um, and what they actually need. Uh, so when um, I'm I'm very lucky with my uh, with my covers in that uh, my first editor at Tor knew that I had been an art director. Um, Irene Gallo, when she was the art director for Tor, knew that I had been an art director so that I would get to see a, a fairly early draft or concept thing. And I would I would be able to respond and tell them the things that they needed to, to know without getting in their way, without trying to do their job for them. So one of the things that I found that's uh, really useful is that if I give them kind of a one pager, which is like, um, here's uh, here are cuttings of character descriptions um, from the, because the 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 artist doesn't really have time to read the book. Of course, yeah. Um, so here are character descriptions from the book. Um, here are some pivotal scenes from the book. Uh, these are thematic elements from the book. Tonally, the book is you know this is tonally the book. Um, and then stay out of the way. Uh, the um, like the cover for Ghost Talkers, I, I got that cover and I was just like, yeah, no, this is exactly what I the perfect, perfect, great, um, and nothing like I would have conceived on my own. Um, the same with uh, with calculating stars, and and again, you know, with um, with one of the the was it calculating stars. Or um, I think it was Relentless Moon. They showed me the cover and I was like, this is fantastic. Uh, but it looks like you have them on the surface of the moon without helmets. Mm. And <laughs> um, and I'm like, can we can we do some work around? Because part of my brand is is some accuracy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what can we do? And And the concern was that they wanted it to be clear that these were women astronauts. I'm like, yeah, I agree. You know, re you know, helmet bubble, you know, whatever, just some representation or, or, you know, can we, or, or, or flat ground. So like they're in an airlock or something, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't care what the solution is, but here's the problem I spot. And, um, Greg Manchus, who did the, the silhouettes for that, um, you know, they, they gave him my notes and, uh, he, he tweaked the silhouettes of the astronauts so that it still looked like a standard spacesuit, but there was, but they had helmets and, um, and it also looks like a group of women astronauts. It, it, it's, he's a very good artist. So the it's that kind of, the that, covers are beautiful. Thanks. I, I love them a lot. It's, it's that kind of thing that, that I get to, to do. Yeah. But it's one of those sides of publishing that, um, a lot of writers don't necessarily have that that background in in art, and so 
I'm, I'm sure like your approach where it's like subtly coaxing you towards, you know, my idea, but at the same time, give them the freedom. Cause that freedom with a little bit of constraint is always what will result in something that is totally unexpected for you and probably for the publishers as well. Yeah. And the artist is happier as a result. I think it's a really cool thing that you have that, that background. And when it comes to your writing, you know, what were the initial sparks for the glamorous histories books? Cause that was the, that, that was your first fully published novel. Yeah. That was the first book in that series. Um, that one, like the first sparks are, um, are actually a uh, flash fiction writing contest. Oh, cool. Um, and I can't remember what the prompt was. I think it was a line of poetry. Um, and I wrote something that is contains a lot of the um, the first chapter of, of the novel. And then I started trying to turn it into a radio play because I was doing radio theater at the time. And strangely, a a visual form of magic is not the ideal for a radio play. (laughs) Weird, weird. Um, Who would have thunk? (laughs) Yeah, but uh, but then there was a point at which I was reading. um, I was doing a a palate cleanser. I just finished a big epic fantasy and was doing a reread of Persuasion which is the the Jane Austen novel that I love best. And I was like crying all over again when I get to Captain Wentworth's letter. And I was like, this is what I want. I want this intimate family drama that is also magic. Like, why don't I, why can't I have Jane Austen with magic? Um, and so that became the novel. Um, and it was difficult. It was really interesting how much I wanted to put an evil overlord in there. <laughs> like J- Jane Austen doesn't have evil overlords. Yeah. But why can't I, if I have magic, why can't I have that too? Well, I, I put in the evil overlord in the second book, which is Napoleon. <laughs> mm-hmm. And on that note, you know, how did you, how did you take your inspiration? You know, you mentioned persuasion, but you know, I get the feeling that Jane Austen, you know, her, a lot of her bibliography is very in- influential on you. How did you pull that as well as stuff from other classical authors or even history and then expand this first book into a five book series? So um, I, I knew what I was doing at the time, but I didn't have all of the words that I needed to describe it. Um, I think that there's basically genre can break into two basic types. There's structure driven genres and there's aesthetic driven genres. So a structure driven genre is something like, um, murder mystery, romance, that kind of thing. Uh, aesthetic driven genres are things like science fiction, fantasy that are driven much uh, historical, historical are often, uh, aesthetic driven. You're, you're there for the world and the world building. And, and this, you know, also the sense of wonder, the G whiz factor, all of that. So it turns out that you can map two of those, a structure and an aesthetic, onto each other really well. So the first book is a straight-up Jane Austen pastiche. And I knew as the series went forward that, um, that audiences wanted the same but different. The natural evolution, the common thing for a same but different would have been to follow the the romance route, which is that the second book would have been about Melody, Jane's sister, and uh, and her search for love. That's so it would have been the same would have been the structure and the different would have been a different cast of characters. That's that's the way romance moves. And I knew for myself that I did not want my career to be writing Regency romances. I enjoy them but that's not what I wanted. So I decided that my same would be the cast of characters and my different would be the structure. So the second book is a uh, wartime spy novel disguised as a Regency romance. The third book is a political thriller, political thriller courtroom drama disguised as a Regency romance. The fourth book is basically Jane Austen writes to Ocean's Eleven. So, you know, it's like just switching it up with each book. Um, And that also one of my goals there was to train my readers that uh, 
for when I stopped writing the glamorous histories that I would write all over the map, but that, that you know, no learning what things they gravitated towards, you know, what are the the same, the things that I should keep the same. Like they really like it when I write committed couples. Great. My books will have committed couples. <laughs> I like that though, because it's like at the same time you're keeping it fresh for readers. You're keeping it fresh mm -hmm. for yourself. You're not yeah. painting yourself into a corner, writing yourself into a corner in this case, yeah. where you don't have as much flexibility because you're working within the confines of, of genre expectations. And that can be a tricky, tricky business, you know? And I think, yeah. you know, even with the, the Lady Astronaut series, you did exactly the same thing. You set up the world with the first book. And then you started to play with genre with mm -hmm. the same cast of characters, all the while introducing different, different people and different elements and stuff like that. But same characters changing up the structure in order to keep it fresh and all that kind of stuff, which I really, really love, you know, and then in terms of the lady astronaut series, where did that come? Where did that idea come from? I know you have a committed couple in there. Check. Yeah. You know, check. but where, where else did all that come in? Uh, I had this idea so it actually started with um, a story called We Interrupt This Broadcast. Um, and then, but the the series starts with, um, with a, a novelette called The Lady Astronaut of Mars. And um, I wanted to write something, I, I jokingly called it my punch card punk universe. Because <laughs> my dad worked for IBM, and one of my real, like some of my really early memories, were going with him to IBM at a time when things were still programmed with punch cards. Yeah, and getting to you know see the giant machines with the big reels of tape and the you know and the punch cards, and so technically the first program thing I programmed was with punch cards. It was just you know making a computer show my name, but still, mm -hmm. that was to me like the the wonder around computing and technology from that era which is also the era of apollo you know i was like i was born in 69 so you know those early memories are from the early 1970s and and that's you know that's all apollo era so i i was like what would have happened if we had Put the same amount of money into continued to put the same amount of money into the Apollo era into the uh, the space program that we did we're doing for Apollo. You know, would we have had the twenty years from Mars that everyone said we would? Like, yeah, I, I think we we would have. Um, so uh, so so I did I did that and came up with the Lady Astronaut of Mars and then. When my publisher asked for a novel version of that, I was like, let me go back to um to to the meteor strike because there's so many interesting stories to tell around this meteor hitting the planet hmm. and um and there and that's where we landed with with good elma choice. good choice of words there <laughs> <laughs> i like that though it's because like you have you have sort of like an end end goal to work towards mm -hmm. um and then you also have a beginning point to work with as well and it's like yeah. filling out the gaps it's we, we we talked about this with Sylvain when we did the modern sci-fi thrillers episode that, you know, working with history is very interesting because you have sort of defined events mm -hmm. within within which you can you can play around. But for you, you're kind of, you know, setting up your own events to play around in and then tweaking history to your yeah. own, you know, creative satisfaction. And and for you, what was it like kind of building on history, but giving it that alternate trajectory and what kind of flexibility and um, and fun, but also constraint did that give you? Um, I, I have a fair bit of flexibility because, you know, you land a meteor in Washington, D.C., and, and it changes a lot of things. <laughs> um, the 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 constraints that I, I have are that I, I know what I'm aiming towards and I know that in Lady Astronaut of Mars, they are still using punch cards, um, which it's like, hmm, okay, so why are they still using punch cards 40 years after the meteor strike? And, um, and 
for me, the reason is because computer miniaturization in our era, in our timeline, happened to solve the problems, uh, to solve making something small enough and light enough to go onto a computer, small enough and light enough to go on a spacecraft. Um, because they didn't trust the Apollo astronauts to do the calculations. And some of the calculations, it's like, you know, um, yeah, legit. Um, <laughs> and to a certain degree, I am treating math like a magic system, you know. Um, but what I decided was that if they are solving it a different way, which is to send computers and people who, to do the math up, then the pressure to miniaturize is is less present. So what I decided was that I was going to advance all of the rocketry stuff, um, that I'm I'm allowed to use rocketry technology that's um, 10 to 20 years advanced of where, where we are in the timeline. But all of the computer technology, I am keeping 10 to 20 years behind where we are in the timeline, depending on which piece of technology I'm looking at. Mm. Um, and that's that's so that I can, uh, partly I, I'm like, I don't think it's implausible that that's the way it would play out. But also um, because I, I have a timeline that I have to, you know, I have to stick with there are also places where i'm like and elma is just wrong about that you know her she's very good with math but her memory <laughs> about dates can be a little spotty sometimes it's not her fault it's okay <laughs> not her fault. no but it, it also kind of plays into the aesthetic thing as well it's because like yeah. you are combining aesthetic and structure in so many ways throughout the series mm -hmm. and i think that punch card punk thing is an aesthetic yeah and that really plays into this kind of it's it's like looking at 1920s 1930s 1940s 1950s version versions of futurism and the concepts yeah. of the future and the aesthetics are very much of the time even if the technology is is advancing at a different pace you know so it's really mm -hmm. interesting to look back on that kind of stuff and be like wow okay we don't have the flying cars but we do have you know smart computers in our pockets and, and yeah. all this kind of stuff yeah. is really interesting. I was curious, you know, what is your perception of, of the modern, uh, it's not a space race cause it's just so disjointed, uh, in comparison to the Soviet versus U S version of the space race. But what's your perception of modern, um, you know, uh, NASA and, and all these, uh, different things that are going on in space and, and hopes to get to the moon again and all this kind of stuff. This is a, a, a thing that we have seen multiple times over the, the centuries. Um, the most recent one, the, the one most people are aware of, um, that the, the model that I point to is uh, our airplanes that, that there was this, er, you know, there was this race like, yes, Orville and Wilbur Wright were the first people to get the airplane off the ground and have a sustained flight. They were not the only ones building planes at that point. Mm -hmm. There was a big race going on, a big push in multiple countries. And so when that first happens, um, what you have is you've got that, and then you've got military application in World War, World War I. And then, and you like realize they got off the ground in 1910. So that's like, it's just like right after they get off the ground. And then what you have are you have wealthy people flying planes. Um, and then you start to get commercial air travel. And commercial air travel becomes kind of ubiquitous and available for people. For, for general people sometime around in the 1950s, mm -hmm. uh, 1950s, 1960s. That's when you start seeing uh, general public start to, to get on planes. Um, it's still mostly for the elite, but it is, it is starting to become available. We are 50 years after the, the moon landings. So this is about the right time on that time, when you think about these timelines, this is about the right time for commercial space travel to begin happening. This is about the right time for wealthy people to go into space for no reason mm -hmm. other than that they want to go into space. 
or launch their cars or whatever. <laughs> right. So, um, so for me, this, this is one of those things that makes complete sense. Um, it's, uh, something that I'm excited about, um, while at the same time being skeptical about it. Um, you know, I, it would be nice if things were not driven by uh, capitalism, but here we are. This is, yeah. this is the, uh, timeline that we're in. Um, but what it means, like that, this period that we're in, where the only people who can go are people who are, um, who are extremely wealthy and going just because they can, and you know, basically up and back down again. Um, those were the early plane flights, right? Yeah. Early plane flights where you get in a plane and you go for uh you go for a spin, you go for a ride at a fair. And it's like, yeah, no, it's this is a phase that we have to go through. It, if if we want space to be for everyone, this is a, a phase that we have to go through. What I would like is if we learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past and start thinking ahead about how space can actually be for everyone by thinking about ways to make you know accessibility. And uh, once we start thinking about going up and having you know longer duration things, like um, trying to come up with models that are not built on colonialism, you know, there, there's there are choices that we can make. So one of the things that I try to do in my books um, is model futures, but um, but base. I mean, the trajectory that we're on currently uh, is that space is going to become available and it's going to be highly commercial, um, and uh, with, with some corners that are reserved for science. Yeah. It's going to be a big cosmic land grab all yep. over again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fascinating. There's a, there's a history podcast that I love called our fake history, um, by a fellow Canadian, Sebastian mm -hmm. major. And he actually, he goes through the, the sort of history and trajectory of, of, um, the first flights and kind yeah. of, his whole thing is about combating myths and, and understanding if it's fact or fiction. Yeah. And it's so cool to hear about the history of, of uh, aeronautics and, you know, the fact that Brazil kind of uh, maintains that they're the ones who first, uh, who first, you know, achieved flight and all this kind of stuff. Whereas Americans or, or most of the Western world thinks of it as the Wright brothers. And, and so it's this cool little, yeah. uh, you know, combative, attitude there but i totally agree with you it's just yeah it's um one of those beautiful things that science fiction can do in order to map out potentialities in the future yeah. and i think it's good that you know fiction like yours and and other authors are trying to be more optimistic and and pragmatic about it as opposed to like yeah let's just do everything we did on earth and fuck it all up over again in yeah. space you know it's like i hope not but um how about book 4 in the series uh, which I think right now is titled The Martian Contingency, mm -hmm. correct? How's that coming along? Um, I turned in the outline literally yesterday. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I have uh, written an exploratory first chapter. Um, my my editor and I had already talked through the synopsis, so the, the outline is just letting her know where I'm thinking about my chapter breaks mm -hmm. currently. Um, and and like some some details that we had talked about, uh, but I'm 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 diving in and excited about it. It starts uh, basically two minutes after the end of Faded Sky. Great, <laughs> I love that. And that is that one. Are you thinking that'll be the last one to lead into? Uh, the end of the series or um it's i mean publishing is such a mystery i don't have any books contract to pass that point okay um, i'm certain that i will write other short stories if nothing else cool well uh, let's get into the spare man because mm -hmm. i love i love dashiell hammett's work and and i love that you took his 1934 novel the thin man and just really um took inspiration from it but at the same time used it as an opportunity for experimentation and critique which i really love but how how was it that that book was the one that you kind of took this inspiration from and and decided to play around with 
Well, it's not actually the book. Um, it's it's the films. Oh, ah, okay. Um, yeah, I I mean I I know I'm fairly certain that I have read the book at some point, but I was less I was less interested in that. The thing for me is the the um, chemistry between William Powell and Myrna Loy, who play Nick and Nora in in the films. Um, there's a there's a playfulness in the films that I just love. Um, and it's it's also I realized one of the the places for me that had modeled this, you know, healthy, committed relationship. Is mm -hmm. it within the confines of the 1930s? Yes, but that is like they are equals in that relationship. And there's a, so much trust between them. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love that. So um I I've I've been telling people that like I don't actually remember for certain how I, I was like, I'm going to do this. I think, um, I think that what happened was that I was doing a demonstration of how you come up with an elevator pitch. And I'm like, something like the thin man in space. I'm like, Oh, hold on. <laughs> hold on. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent certain that that's how I came up with that. I, it may have started with, I was on a cruise ship and I'm like, I want to do a murder mystery on a cruise ship. Maybe like the thin man in space. So, I, but I do know that the elevator pitch came before I had really anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, just to keep him with the mystery, the origin is a mystery too. Right. Could, yes, it could have been exactly. a cruise ship, could have been an yeah. elevator pitch, but I love what it became. And, and, you know, using Nick and, and Nora as sort of this um, template, on which you could build Tesla and Shao. Mm -hmm. Where did how did they kind of come about, and what was it like kind of building them as characters and then forming that relationship? So I have um, there's a couple of things that I, I will do when I'm I'm working from uh, from a historical thing or a historical and existing property. I did this with the uh, Jane Austen and Persuasion, and I did this with the the Thin Man. Is that I'll invert an element from the original. So in persuasion, it's, you know, um, Anne Elliot's father is completely self-absorbed and has not planned ahead for his his daughters. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what happens if if I flip that? And so in, you know, uh, in my books, uh, my heroine's father has planned ahead for his daughters. Um, and with the spare man, um, I could have, I thought about doing a, a gender swap so that the detective is, uh, that Nora is the detective, you know, that, mm -hmm. uh, or that Nick is a, you know, is, is a woman and, and Nora is a, is a man and um, decided that that was not as interesting to me because the thing that I find really interesting is when there's someone who has an area of competence and they aren't allowed to to use that competence. So the first thing that I did was the thing that I inverted is that I had my Nick, Xiao, um, arrested so that he couldn't investigate. So mm -hmm. that it had to be uh it had to be my Nora character investigating. So I, I wanted to take Xiao off of the table as an investigator. So that I could shift all of the power into Tesla, who is my my Nora, um, and put her in a position where she can investigate. Because in the Thin Man movies, Te Nora always wants to do investigating, and Nick is constantly like saying, "No, it's it's actually this is actually an area of expertise, and it's kind of dangerous. You should stay home." Mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, which <laughs> is actually good advice. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I decided to do that. Um, there are a couple of other things that I, I flipped as well, but um, but again, in the the same but different uh, category, you know, again, I know that my my readers are coming because um, because I have you know happily committed couple, um, but one of the things that I learned. That, that people responded well to in the Lady Astronaut books um, was a uh, was dealing with um, was was dealing with mental health, mm. and so um, so I thought about you know what uh, what what baggage 
Tesla would be carrying. Because, um, again, uh, you know, things that I have learned as I continue to to write and move through the world is that we have this idea of, um, you know, neurotypical, and I've learned that there are very few neurotypical people out there. Um, like the the number of people who actually fit that are like it, it's they they're they are atypical actually yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um so at this point in my life i kind of assume that everybody has something going on and some of it's been diagnosed and some of it hasn't um so i i kind of think about okay so how do how do how do my characters brains work mm. and i love i love that you use that as a it's a way to really get inside Tesla's head, you know? It's like not only is is Shao, you know, arrested, but he's also a retired detective. So there's this reluctance there. Mm -hmm. And for her, there's kind of this desire to prove herself after an accident, an accident that has resulted in trauma for her, you know? And I think it's it works really well in the sense that it's like, here we have this cozy space mystery with a character who has mm -hmm. experienced trauma and us as readers and you as a writer have all experienced the trauma of a pandemic and all the crap that has ensued as a result of that. I was really curious, how was it for you? Yeah. I think you brought it up in the acknowledgements. Like what was it like writing this during the pandemic? It was really hard. I wrote, a, um, I'm not sure how far into it I was when pandemic hit. Um, but writing ground to it like I, I i had a little while where i was still productive and then it, it just kept slowing down um but i did have to go back in and add the masks because it was just i could not i still can't imagine a future anymore that people don't wear masks at least occasionally you know um but because i want to model a future i decided to call them courtesy masks it's something that you wear because you're being courteous to the people around you mm -hmm. um and it was, there were a couple of other things that I thought about changing um, and, and decided not to because, um, because I felt like it would lose some of the, um, the frothiness of, it, you know, <laughs> of, of, of a Nick and Nora. Mm -hmm. uh, episode uh nick and nora film uh but but also because um i it felt like i was trying to predict or make a comment about things and and i i feel like my science fiction is most successful when i'm trying to model a future that i want to see mm -hmm. and think about the steps that need to get to that future than when i'm trying to predict what's going to happen Right. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. It's like you created the space station and it has so much. Um, it's kind of like this this realistic nature that you brought in from the Lady Astronaut series where it's like you're thinking about the gravity in these different rings. So it's like you have the the Earth ring, the Mars ring, the lunar ring, and each of them has their corresponding gravity that also caters to uh, people who are on this cruise ship from that respective locale, but it also plays into the story itself. And, and, you know, I know you brought up a cruise ship before, but what has your experience has been like on a cruise ship and how did you kind of translate that into imagining this future space? I guess like, would you call it like a space cruise ship? Yeah. Or, uh, oh yeah. No, it's a yeah. hundred percent a space cruise ship. Yeah. Uh, a luxury space cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, it is, so I think I've been on a, 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 about a dozen, 14 cruises, somewhere in there. And um, most of them have been on Royal Caribbean. Um, but with a, but then I've been on a couple of others. I've been on MSC and uh, Holland America. And all of them are just bonkers. Um it's like they're giant. It's it's a giant resort, and every day you're in a different. There's a different place outside your door. Mm -hmm. So there are all of these things that they they have to have stuff going on constantly, 
in order to for for crowd management so yeah. that it feels like it isn't crowded once you get underway because you know you've got 500 people in the theater at any given time um but it's like the uh royal caribbean oasis of the seas this ship is so big there's an arboretum like there are trees <laughs> growing inside this greenhouse arboretum thing there's That's crazy. a crazy full-size ferris wheel uh, ferris wheel uh not uh not ferris carousel wheel. full-size merry-go-round full-size merry-go-round there there were there were there was a, a water show like like Cirque du Soleil's water shows with three story Olympic diver like a, a board diving boards with Olympic divers. There, there's ice skating, ice skating. So I, I was like, well, this is uh, this is this is exactly if anyone is going to build a bonkers ship like this, it's going to be. It's going to be a luxury cruise line. It, mm. it had a bar. It had a bar that was an elevator bar that would go up through multiple levels that also had trees growing on it. I mean, it was just it's like so unnecessary. <laughs> like, it's like how can we be some extra? And that's yeah. one of the things that I found with all of the cruise ships that I've been on on every line. It's like, what can we do that's extra? Mm. So, um, but they they also really. Um, Royal Caribbean in particular really cares about uh, catering to their guests. So you get all of these things ahead of time and the cruise that you wind up being on, even though you're on the cruise with everybody else is definitely like, you definitely have an experience that is geared towards you. Um, they're super careful about allergies and things like that. Anyway. Um, so I, uh, I was just like, well, what does this look like in the future? <laughs> This bonkers shit. This <laughs> bonkers ship. It's completely bonkers ship. Um, I'm like, someone would say, well, we should have gravity appropriate for every level um, of passenger. Could we do that? Yes, but we'll have to build this bonkers ship. And someone would be like, I've got money. Let's do it. <laughs> but I love it. It's like this, um, you know, I, I, I always adore when mysteries are you know, confined, uh, physically, you know, there's the, the mysteries that are literally just one room. It's like, what's, mm -hmm. what's happening in this, in this room or it's a house or it's, you know, once, once that locale is centralized, it's so interesting because it really allows you to piece together all these different clues also yeah. lead people in a, in a certain direction with red herrings and stuff like that. How was it that this setting um served as a good uh challenge for you when it came to what we talked about earlier in terms of a structure driven genre like mystery blending that with this with this aesthetic driven driven genre of science fiction and using that setting to give you the the playground through which you could twist people's minds a little bit and lead them in the wrong direction and plant clues all over the place yeah it's um so when you're dealing with a mystery, I, one of the things that I did was I, I sat down and I, I watched um, all six of the Thin Man movies. Um, the first two Dashiell Hammett was involved in. And then after that, he's, he's not involved. It's just the characters. Mm -hmm. And they all have very similar elements. There, there's certain beats that all of them hit. There's certain beats that most most mysteries hit. You know, there's the red herring. There's the um there's the uh accusing the wrong person like this is this is a thing that that happens in in every everything that everyone is convinced that it's the wrong person and then then the sudden final clue comes together and you realize who it is um and i had read that agatha christie did not plot her mystery novels interesting wow yes i was real mad about this when i found this <laughs> how dare you uh, pants <laughs> Uh, and what she did, and I've heard several other mystery writers say that they do the same thing, is that they come up with a cast of characters, all of whom have mo motive and opportunity, and who are interconnected. And um, and then they just let things happen, 
And then, and then at the end, they decide which one of them actually did it. And that's when they reveal the final clue. So I was like, well, let me try this. Um, so I, I had a couple of tent post pieces that I knew I wanted. Um, you know, I, I knew, uh, the, I knew how I wanted the, um, uh, the part of the reveal. I knew how I wanted part of that. I knew how, I knew how I, I wanted the murders to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, but I didn't always know who I wanted to do the murder, um, who I wanted to be involved. Uh, so I made sure that I gave everybody motive and opportunity. And, um, and, and sometimes that meant, you know, I'm in a scene, I'm like, oh, wait, everybody is accounted for right now. Who can I get off stage right now? And how? How do I get them off stage so that they have opportunity in this moment so that we aren't ruling them out? And um, and that was that was a lot of fun. So I get I think I did that about halfway through of just like, OK, let's see what happens. Um because again, like looking at the Thin Man movies, the stuff that's really fun in the Thin Man movies um, are are watching Nick and Nora. Is it's the banter, right? Hmm. And in a lot of mysteries, it's the watching the 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 subtle interrogations that are going on. And so I was like, let me just introduce these characters. I will pants my way through. You know, I'm going to do a little bit of improv here. Um, and then, uh, and then I had to sit down and figure out, um, somewhere around the, as I was approaching the three quarter mark, um, I had to reverse engineer everything, my outline, um, so that I could, could, uh, for myself, I actually did need to, to outline the ending. And, um, and so I reverse engineered it, put all of the, the elements that I had in play that were not, hadn't been resolved yet onto note cards, arranged all the note cards, color coded on the floor. Um, <laughs> like a real detective. Like a real detective. Then my cats, this is this is true and literally happened. My cats played tag across it. <laughs> Just shuffled and up everything. <laughs> everything. Uh, my carefully arranged order, but I looked at it and I'm like, oh, actually this is a little better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy accident. Yeah. Um, so the uh, I, uh, this is one of my favorite things. There's a, a scene where they have yoga, and that was in a totally different place in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the characters that we meet in that scene, we had met earlier in another part, like in a different, like all of that had happened. Like, uh, you know, I had we had met them earlier, and and then we were seeing them again in the yoga studio, and when when the my cat shuffled things. It was like, oh, actually, this is this is better in part because it allowed me to compress some earlier stuff by removing a couple of the meetings and having them happen in the yoga studio, and um, and and that that was great. So then I, uh, you know, wrote towards the end, did a lot of revisions. Um, I, I mean, a lot of revisions. What I it was like one revision passed, but it was a pretty heavy handed one. Mm-hmm. And the result, though, for me, it was really great. And speaking of of pets who come in and mix shit up, you got your <laughs> you've got Gimlet. Is it Gimlet or Jimlet? Gimlet. Gimlet. So you got Gimlet, the dog, who is so fantastic because it's you know it's the thing that I love about dogs, and which cats are they probably understand, but they don't they don't care to show us. But dogs are very revealing about character and about how they. Um, smell people and and react to them and stuff like that. And I loved how Gimlet was sort of this like bullshit sniffing mechanism throughout <laughs> throughout the book. And it's just like someone's saying something and Gimlet reacts a certain way. And you even use Gimlet as a device to to reveal certain characters for for who they really are. And I love that you were able to incorporate an animal, play on uh, Nick and Nora's own animal companion in The Thin Man. And then, you know, I was curious how you sort of tried to um, fit that in with Tesla and Shal as characters, but also kind of make it your make it your own and and um, give Gimlet his own personality. Yeah. Um, so Gimlet is based on um, three dogs. Uh, she's an inversion of Asta, 
the original dog uh, because Asta, anytime there's trouble, goes and hides under something. And I'm like, Gimlet, no, Gimlet's a service dog. Gimlet's going to be like right in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, there's a real dog named Gimlet, who's a Westie, who belongs to my friend Eileen Cook, who's a phenomenal writer. Highly recommend uh, all of her books. Um, like it's, uh, she's she's amazing. She's got, a, um, oh shoot, I can't remember the name of the book. Uh, you Owe Me a Murder, um, which is, uh, it's basically instead of, it's strangers on a plane instead of mm. on a train and with teenagers in London. It's so good. Awesome. Um, anyway, so Gimlet, her Gimlet is adorable, opinionated little Westie. She is, loves people. She's a perfect dog um, and also hates delivery people. Uh, <laughs> then my mom has a service dog, Captain, who's a chocolate lab. He's a stability dog. And he is, um, again, like he's such a good dog, but he's also he's a he's a lab so if you leave any food out it is you know you're just it that food no longer exists <laughs> and when they gave us when we got them his trainer said he's a dog not a robot you have to remember that he is a dog not a robot so i combined all of that to to give me uh my gimlet um my gimlet uh, one of the, the things that i've seen a couple of people say is um comment on the fact that tesla is often saying, you know, go say hi. And that this is like, that the dog is not doing, this is not how any service dog works. I'm like, no, this is a hundred percent how my mom's service dog works. Cause my mom has Parkinson's and she hates having people stare at her. Mm-hmm. And so, um, if captain is not actively being stability dog for her, she will say, go say hi. And then everyone pays attention to this ridiculously nice chocolate lab and pets him and no one is looking at her mm-hmm. um and you know it's not something she does all the time and that's why there's a command and it's why go say hi is a command um and i i went back and f- i i did debate about giving tesla a stability dog instead of a ptsd dog um but decided that she was um because she because she can be she can get stability from a cane that uh the the piece that she needed more help with was the ptsd and that that was that was the the dog that made more sense for her was a ptsd dog like an emotional service dog psychological service dog yeah so there's um so service dogs are there's there's a a difference between a um a service dog and an emotional support dog uh, and you can have a service dog that deals with that's a psychological su- support dog mm-hmm. uh, or service dog. Um, but these are these are dogs that are trained to have specific behaviors. So Gimlet mm-hmm. has an alert. Um, so one of Gimlet's behavior is alert. Um, another of Gimlet's behavior is, um, ooh, I think I can't remember what it's called. I think it's removal um, or uh, uh, extraction. I can't remember now. Shoot. Uh, but basically. Um, she will alert, which is she'll put her paw on Tesla to say, you know, you need to stop and breathe right now. Mm. Um, or if she feel if she can tell that a panic attack is incoming, she will guide Tesla out of a room. Right. Um, if a, a full on panic attack is in process, she'll also guide Tesla out of the room. Um, so those are and the go say hi is is the third one. Uh, the third behavior. So, so Gimlet has those three behaviors and then standard obedience training. Um, there are other uh, service dogs with, that will have comfort as a, uh, as a, a, one of their, their behaviors that, you know, something, something is happening and they, they will, uh, they will lean or, or, you know, rest their head on, or, you know, in some other way, provide comfort to the person um, an emotional support dog is, um, while it is, it is possible for those dogs to learn some of those things. They are not trained to have those behaviors. Um, like you can say, oh no, I have a, an emotional support dog that is, you know, you know, like I could say that that Elsie, my cat, was my emotional support cat because I feel better when she's here, not because she is trained to do a thing. And right, there's, you right. know, it's. 
I, I, I know that there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Gimlet is very clearly Gimlet, Gimlet is definitely a service dog. Yeah, I had no idea uh, that Mandy, there was that much. Wait, Go for it. Yeah. yeah quick PSA: um, If you ever see a service dog with a you know with the red vest or you know anything that says service dog, there are things that you can do to help because the service dog is a dog, not a robot. Um, so don't make eye contact with the dog because if the dog is making eye contact with you, they are not paying attention to their person. Mm. Um, don't try to touch the dog. Um, and don't talk to the dog. Very good advice. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I, I've seen dogs like that, but I never, I never really understood the nuance there, but having Gimlet in this story just added so much to Tesla's character, to Shal's character. It, it, you know, just the presence of this animal really added a lot to the story. So I appreciated that. And on top of that, we brought it up earlier. You know, you you start each chapter with a different cocktail. And a lot of the time these cocktails play into sort of like a um thematic in-joke about the chapter mm -hmm. itself, which I really appreciated. Yeah. How many of these cocktails actually exist? And 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 for you in particular, you know, you wrote in the acknowledgments that not all of these cocktails have to be made with alcohol, which mm -hmm. I really appreciate. It's like a lot, a lot of these are, you're able to make them without the alcohol and still have a really delicious, uh, well, you didn't call it mocktail, but you called it something else that I really like. Zero proof. Zero proof cocktail. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have, you can have a high proof cocktail, which mm -hmm. is, uh, very spirit forward. Um, you can have a low proof cocktail and then you can have a zero proof cocktail. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that the, the point of a cocktail is that you've combined flavors in an unexpected way to have a celebratory uh, fun beverage. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm firmly of the opinion that you should be able to do that. Um, and that like I do not, I, I enjoy flavors. I don't enjoy being drunk. And so I'm like, yeah, I will sometimes at home home i'll make a zero proof cocktail um so all of them are real cocktails um or, or all of them existed in the world before this except for six that i invented because um i didn't have um the the, the downside to many of the existing zero proof cocktails is that the names are things like shirley temple or roy rogers i'm like mm -hmm. you know they are lovely flavors but not thematic for a murder mystery yeah but what, when did it come into into the writing process that you decided i'm going to start each chapter with oh, a cocktail at the beginning yeah because it's like this feels so natural and there are even times where they drink that exact cocktail or they order it or something in in the chapter yeah. i'm like oh man that's beautiful just <laughs> yeah thanks yeah the um so the the thin man movies when you when you first meet nick he is teaching bartenders how to make a martini. Yeah. So I, I was like, okay, this book has to start with martini as the first cocktail. Of course. Got to keep it classic. <laughs> yeah. And we already mentioned earlier the Martian contingency, but what else does mm -hmm. the, the future hold for you as a writer or even other projects that you're working on? Yeah. Um, so I'm uh, the, the project after the Martian contingency that I've got, that I've been talking about with my, um, my agent, I think you're going to be the first person who hears about this, um, is a, uh, a YA science fiction fantasy uh, contemporary um, uh, school kids coven and, you know, and then things do not go the way they think they're going to go with that. Um, it's called The Smallest Magic right now. Uh, I do not have an elevator pitch for it at this point. <laughs> um, okay. I have a synopsis. <laughs> um, but I, I haven't figured out how to elevator pitch it yet. Um, I've got some short stories that I want to write. Uh, I just sold a short story to Uncanny Magazine um, called Cold Relations that'll be coming out sometime next year. Um, and then uh, it's, you know, uh, after, besides the pandemic, um, I also... Uh, had I was the president of CIFWA and then I decided to run uh, Worldcon in 2021 for reasons um, that seemed like a good decision at the time. And I'm like, I'm deeply proud of the people that I worked with and I'm mm -hmm. glad I did it. And also uh, on, on the writing front, it was uh, perhaps not my best choice. 
<laughs> so, um, so I'm just kind of getting back into the swing of things. Um, so normally I'm like, well, this and then this and then this, but right now I'm like, I've got this one book that I need to write and then I'll figure out what the next, what happens after that. That's totally fair. I'm putting together a virtual, uh, SFF convention for January, TBR con, and that's just virtual. And it's already yeah. like, it's so much logistically. Yeah. But I can't even imagine what would be involved in Worldcon because that is a it's, massive it's, endeavor. It is a massive endeavor and it is made of a, just a bajillion. Actually, it's not a bajillion. It's, uh, it is made of, 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 a lot of really smart dedicated volunteers and not enough smart dedicated volunteers mm. there's always you always need one more everyone's overloaded um but they were it was they were such good people i'd love them um uh actually thank you for saying workshop um uh, uh writing conference um in uh, may of uh 2023 uh we're running um a writing excuses workshop um which uh, we've started doing small person, small group workshops uh, in the uh, like with 42 students mm -hmm. um, because that's the answer. Uh, but this one will be um, courses and, and writing. So, um, so it'll be for people who are interested in learning a little bit about animal husbandry. So you'll go for two, uh, two rides. Um, talk with blacksmiths. We've got someone coming in to do falconry um, over the course of five days um, and, and with writing workshops in addition to writing workshops. Our enunciation is going to have to be so good for this. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds phenomenal though. I love that. It's like you get to write, but you also get to experience the things that it's like this thing where a writer has to wear so many hats, but a lot of the time we're just bullshitting certain hats. Yeah. And to be able to actually experience that even for uh, two days or something like that, or two afternoons, whatever, mm -hmm. that's going to give you so much more insight than you could ever have imagined or conjured up in your head to think this is what it plausibly is like based yeah. on my internet research or whatever. I really yeah, love and, that. And the stable that we're working with is really excited about working with us to craft workshops um, that are designed to help writers. It's like... It, Horses turn up in historical fiction and fantasy and con contemporary fiction. Um, they're just, you know, Westerns. They, they show up in a lot of places and a lot of people have, you know, have not had the opportunity. Um, or if they have, it's been it's been limited. And we're, we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, use this as a springboard for talking about, you know, how do you bank sensory details when you're doing this kind of work. And so we're, we're having uh, very craft focused uh, classes that use the practical demonstrations we're doing as, as the grounding for the classes that we're teaching. Oh, that's an amazing combination. Well, yeah, I'll definitely link to that. Send me the link for that and I'll share it with everybody in the description. But uh, just to close out, you know, what are you currently, I know you're on the road, but what are you currently reading or watching or listening to anything awesome that you'd like to share with listeners and viewers? Um, so I'm currently listening to the uh, Monsters We Defy by Leslie Penelope. It's a fantastic yeah, audio book. So good. It, oh, you're listening to it too? It's so good. Oh my God. I've, I've read the book, but the book is okay. amazing. I'm sure the yeah. audio book is also fantastic. Oh, it's fantastic. And then um, uh, The Future is Female, um, edited by Lisa Yazek. Uh, um, it is 25 classic science fiction stories by women. Uh, Going from uh, Claire, Harris, Claire Winger Harris in 1928 oh, wow. through Ursula K. Le Guin in 1969, so it's uh, it it's accompanied with um, an essay. the The sequel to it comes out next week, as we are recording this. Um, but it's it's so interesting. Um, I knew that women had been written out of history. In terms of science fiction, I did not realize how, like, I knew that we had always been there. I did not realize how extremely present we had been from the very, you know, like Mary Shelley, yes, but from the beginning of the pulp era. Yeah, um, yeah. 
and they're like it's just it's it's really interesting reading the evolution of of women's engagement with science fiction Fantastic. Well, thank you for those recommendations. And yeah, shout out to Leslie. She's amazing. Her book is fantastic. She's yeah. going to be on a future episode and I'm really excited oh, to, to chat with yeah. her. Uh, but Mary Robinette, thank you so much for taking the time today. It was yeah. wonderful talking with you. And I highly recommend everyone go check out The Spare Man, which is out now. Go check it out in ebook, audiobook, physical, whatever you want to get your hands on. But uh, if you could let listeners and viewers know where they can find you on social media. Um, the easiest thing is to visit my website, maryrobinettekowal.com. That's going to give you a jumping point to me on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter. Um, it's usually some combination of Mary Robinette or Mary Robinette Kowal. And, uh, and then you'll also th see things like tour schedules. And when I do a call for beta readers for my next work in progress. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thanks for talking to me.